All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Another edition of the VB Adrenaline uh, Podcast. And I'm Darren Tipton, again, with a repeat uh, a repeat guest in Dan Meske. Uh, become a really good friend of mine, has helped me out a lot. Uh, last time, we just he just simply taught me how to do a podcast. And now we're actually going to get into uh, the nuts and bolts of uh, some deep dive into the mind of a college volleyball coach when it comes to recruiting. And so with June 15th coming up, um, you know, we're trying to educate not only athletes, parents, but volleyball fans and anybody who follows us with what goes on behind the scenes, but the real take on recruiting uh, from a recruiting coordinator standpoint, an athlete standpoint, a parent standpoint, and now from you know, a college staff standpoint. So Dan, first of all, thank you uh, for the time again. And Aaron, thanks for having me. And I can guarantee I have better Wi-Fi this time. Last time <laughs> I, was, I was going from my house, today I'm in the office and my kids were playing Fortnite. So they crushed all my Wi-Fi and I know we had some Wi-Fi issues. So I made sure I was in the office this time for our podcast. Well, like I've been telling everybody the last three weeks, I am literally in my childhood bedroom. So <laughs> I'm it's still a workation, everybody. And if you have a problem with that, tough. But uh, my Wi-Fi has been good. I think we're good. I don't have the big fancy mic, but uh, um, that's okay. It's going to be great content. I'm excited because uh, Dan keeps it pretty real and and excited to talk about some stuff. But let's, Let's just dive in because I know we can do way more than a half hour of content. But uh we just want to talk about coaches' view on the process. So first of all, let's just talk about what is this time of year like for you? I know with the portal and everything now, coaches really don't get any kind of a break anymore. But what is this specific time like for you? You maybe got a little time off, but June 1, what's it like? Yeah. So... I think it just depends where you're at in your coach's journey. I think for me, I would have found a way to really fill up my time in May. And we were really lucky. Uh, you know, we did hit the portal um, after December. So we hit that kind of mid-year portal, but we didn't really do anything in the spring here. So our May was actually completely free. And we just, as a staff, really had a good opportunity to decompress and unwind. Um, a lot of our staff traveled out of the country and did vacations and things like that. I've got three young boys, um, so they had baseball games. I actually got roped into coaching one of my kids' baseball teams, even though I have, like, no experience with baseball. So we really, in May, had an opportunity to really unwind. You know, in Louisville here, we have the Kentucky Derby, which I know you came for. Yep. That's kind of the kickoff for our break period, but probably unique amongst just our staff in the fact that we worked remote a lot, and we were really able to kind of decompress in May and uh, start to amp up. We just, you know, kind of had our – our first camp uh, meeting today uh, leading into, we got one of our prospect camps coming up this weekend and then we'll keep kind of rolling from there. We'll hit the road and do some college camps and things like that. But really we took a lot of May off and then are really getting right back into it. Like you said, today, June 1st. Uh, so talk about, I, I know one time you guys joked about maybe it was at triple crown or something, but you joked about your going back and updating your, your big board or your war room. Um, and that got me jacked up. I'm a big NFL draft guy and uh, uh, being a former college football coach, we have the same thing. Right. But how do you guys put that together? And is that ever changing like year to year, week to week? And at this time of year, do you feel like that's pretty set or, I mean, can that change June 1st to June 15th? How does that evolve for a program like like Louisville? Yeah, it's it's definitely different in the last probably seven years. When we first got here, the, the list of athletes that improved our talent and our program was pretty vast. Um, we were solid at the time, but it was just we didn't have super, super elite talent yet. Um, now we feel like we're starting to get into that tier. So our list has gotten a little bit smaller, but the amount of work we put in is, is very similar. Um, we're just able to put in more work on more specific uh, talent that we're going after. So as far as the big board goes and, you know, ours is on a whiteboard and it's in dry erase marker and it's really not in a ranking system. It's more of a tier system. Um, but one of the things for us with recruiting is like we just we don't settle. So like we won't have a tier one, tier two, tier three. And it's like if we miss on all tier one, let's go take somebody from tier two. It's like for us, everybody's tier one and you have an opportunity to have a huge role here or, you know, again, with the portal right. or why settle. So for us, it's people that we really think fit our culture and fit what we want to do here. 
um, or it's not. And we don't really try to talk ourselves into anybody else. So like I said, we kind of have our, our tier system of like, yeah, we're really sure. And yeah, we're just about sure. And maybe they're coming to camp or maybe we got to get them on the phone and learn a little bit more. Um, but they're either moving up into that tier of, yeah, we're really comfortable taking them or they're moving out of that tier of like, okay, we're not going to settle and take a chance. And we're not sure, uh, if we're not sure, then we're not, then we're not pulling the trigger. So, you know, that board, as far as a ranking system goes, isn't super specific. I think those June 15th calls help us out a lot. I mean, clearly our, our top targets, you know, we would love to get them on the 15th if we can. Uh, you feel like you have a relationship with them through, through camp and just through them coming to games or whatever it might be. Um, but you know, those June 15th calls are pretty important. Well, and, oh man, my mind's already, my mind's already <laughs> racing. <laughs> so, uh, because I, I catch heck, uh, uh, messages and stuff. Cause they're like, Oh, you, you, you hate Nebraska and you hate Texas. And, and who I'm says like, that <laughs> Joe Johnson? Well, this week it was Wisconsin. Um, people, <laughs> I hate Wisconsin this week. Uh, but, uh, what I simply said was recruiting there is easier than when you were at Augustana University in Sioux Falls. <laughs> yeah, you want me to go into that recruiting no, at D two when we were I losing wrong? kids? Uh, I don't even want to mention the Division one schools we were no. losing recruits to at Augustana. But I, I empathize with you on that of the fact that you know again. All right, I'll take Louisville for example. When I got to Louisville, we were coming off of not a great season. And it was really hard recruiting talent because you don't want to, for us, we didn't want to go down the road of, hey, what, but when you get here, we'll do this. We wanted to show like, hey, we're going to be able to make this program great now and you're going to make it even better when you get here. Not we're biding our time until you get here as this great recruit. That just wasn't a way that we felt like we could be successful. So for us, that was really hard to get those conversations and get people to really buy into a vision that wasn't quite there yet. And they can't look at last year and say like, oh, if it's just like last year, I would enjoy that. It's got to be a new vision, something that hasn't happened. So at Louisville, that was the hardest thing. We had to try to educate recruiting coordinators and club coaches and anybody we could around these athletes of like what our plan was and how we thought we could get where we want to go. You know, did we think we would go to the Final Four within five, six years? Probably not, but it was pretty cool that the plan got us got us there, and it was awesome for the kids that bought into that. On the flip side, when I was at <clears throat> excuse me, when I was at Nebraska, it was still as hard because you were going for the kids that all the other top schools wanted. So again, my my first experience at Louisville, it was so hard to get interest from just kids that would marginally improve your program. When I was back at Nebraska ten years ago. And you're competing against all the other top five, top 10 schools. Well, it was, ju- it was still just as hard to get that interest because all those other 10 schools are putting all of their resources into getting interest from them. So that was an interesting thing I learned recruiting for 20 plus years. And I'm still learning a lot about it is like it never gets easier. It's just the challenges shift, but it's always super hard to get that interest from that kid that you really, really want. It's just maybe a little different level of kid, depending on where your program's at at the time. So for us now at Louisville, it feels like, you know, our, our, the, the talent that we can attract is really, really high, if not some of the top in the country. But it's still as hard as it was seven years ago, because now we're just competing against all these other schools that are dumping all their resources into those same kids. So it shifts, but it doesn't it doesn't get harder or easier. It's it's always very difficult. Well, um, and John, um, uh Famous radio guy, you know how bad I am with names. Um, John Baylor. Yes. Mate, gave you such an awesome compliment at the Final Four when you had him on your podcast. Um, me and four other guys sitting in the crowd listening, but I was there. Um, and he <laughs> said, you did one of the, you twice, you've done one of the hardest things. You guys have done one of the hardest things. The hardest thing to do in volleyball is take a program outside the top 30 and move it in tra- so it's traditionally in the top 10. Yeah. And he said, if you want to see the mark of a great coach, great recruiters, look at somebody who's done that because there's very, very few of them. Right. Yeah. Um, paraphrase. Well, I think right? for, our, for our program, too, we talk about like it, it. it's very, very hard to make that jump. But sometimes it feels even harder to stay kind of in that yeah. top tier because everybody's cha- everybody's chasing that same thing. Right. Um, you know, for us, we had seen so many programs that have done that, that have, you know, gone to a final four and then kind of faded back into obscurity just because you were maxing out one year. It was like that, this one year is our year that we're going to be great. And for us, I think the one thing that served us well at Louisville and hopefully will continue to serve us well is that we don't ever feel like we're building towards another year, building towards, man, in two years, we're going to be maxed out and that's our team. We're always 
thinking and building towards this year's team being the best team we've ever coached. And, you know, this year we have a pretty senior laden team, but in two years, we're going to be talking about the same types of goals just with some new players and new experience, but it's not, okay, now we got a couple of years and then we'll get back. You know, we're always trying to be as good as we can that year. We're not building towards anything else. It's always about the year that's in front of us. So, um, but again, the build to it, I think sometimes we look back and go, man, like, it's a lot harder to stay in that top five, top 10 than it, than it was maybe to crack into it quickly and then pop out. Like a lot of teams have done that. Our big challenge right now is how do we stay in there? And that's part of the reason we're chatting is recruiting is a huge part of that. Hmm. I mean, Cause my defense, what I say to those guys is, Hey, go from the top and then go to school X at like RPI 50 and bring them to a final four. And then I'll say you're an amazing recruiter, right? Like I say, that's a lot harder, but you're saying it's a lot harder to work your way up to number four or five and then stay there. I don't know. I mean, to me, you know, you take it, you could take a list of whoever's listening, your traditional blue bloods, I call them in volleyball, whatever schools you think of when you think of the top five. And a lot of those schools have been there for a very, very long time. You can make another really big list of schools that have been in the top five or been in the top eight or made a final four that now are in the lower part of the top 25 or not even in the top 25. We have some of those conversations amongst our staff of just like, oh my gosh, remember when school X was in the final four? That's like so weird to think about now because again, sometimes it's just a build to one year and then it's a complete rebuild from there. I think the challenge is, again, it goes back to recruiting. It's like you got to nail your recruiting classes every year so that you always have really solid talent in every single class. Um, and then, you know, that plays into the recruiting part is one, but then it's also how do you develop that talent? How do you give really yeah. fun role within your team when you kind of have to wait your turn? I always go back to Claire Chasse. You know, she's somebody who sat in our program and didn't play a lot for two, three years and then was an All-American and is one of the best American volleyball players right now in the pros. And a lot of times those kids don't stick it out. They're a great player and they're not playing their sophomore year and they're like, well, I'm going to go to school X and start right away and get five kills a set. I don't know where we'll end up in the tournament or anything, but at least I'm playing. It's really, really hard to keep those really talented younger players with their eye on, okay, this is going to serve me and the program really well. And I think, again, Claire is a perfect example of that, of like what she's doing right now. I don't know if she would have been able to accomplish that had she not grown through our program and then brought our program where she did. Um, I think that was a really cool experience for her. She developed as a leader and um, a, a love for the game and all that. But sometimes that's harder than the recruiting process is having great players that have to kind of wait their turn. And, and I think that deals with true culture and mock culture, which we'll get into maybe. Uh, but I think you guys definitely have a true culture, which we've talked about. But um, uh, I want to get into – let's talk about that 15th um, because I – uh, I'm a nerd this way, and I sit and think about what what is that like? A, are you guys a 12:01 a.m.? How do you plan it out? Like, hey, Todd's got somebody, you got somebody, DBK's got somebody. How do you plan it out? When do you plan it out? Do you just wing it? I'm guessing you don't wing it. Like, what does it look like in the Louisville War Room on June 15th? So, well, I'll take you back to last year and then the changes we'll see for this year. So last year we were in Brazil. So we were yeah. on our foreign tour, which some schools are going to be this year. And so we had an approach of, you know, let's let's divide up our list. Let's make sure we get our calls and we get our contacts. But let's build towards a better conversation when we get back from Brazil. If there's somebody who is dying to commit somewhere else or dying to commit to us, we can walk down those roads, you know, June 15th, 16th, 17th, whatever. But the vast majority of recruits aren't really doing that. And for us, the, the people who have been really successful here, um, you know, there's been a handful, but that's not the vast majority of what we're recruiting. So we don't really feel the pressure of like, man, if we don't nail the 15th, then what if we forget this? Or what if we forgot that? Um, we don't build that pressure up for us. So again, we divide up our list. We make sure that, you know, the top kids that we really like are, are being contacted. But then also we don't sweat it if there's somebody that really crushes it at nationals. And then we reach out for the first time. Um, a great player in our program right now, who's one, one of the best recruits we've ever gotten. We didn't contact until July 7th. Um, this is a few years ago, but it was somebody that was playing in a different position. 
we saw them in a different position at nationals and then their list kind of dwindled down and they were kind of reopened and we thought, okay, let's give it a shot. So for us, we've been served really well recruiting wise, just being true to ourselves of like, Hey, what's going to work out is going to work out. And sure. There's some momentum with a few recruits that, Hey, let's, let's ride that momentum into the 15th. But for others that are kind of doing a different process, that's going to be a little bit slower and traditional. We're okay with that too. Um, the other thing that I always try to keep in mind is if I'm a recruit and I'm, I'm a good player, I'm going to be getting crushed on the 15th and I'm going to be really excited for the first call. And then I'm going to be pretty excited for the second call. And then I'm going to take the third call and then the fourth call and then the fifth call. And I'm going to see all these assistant coaches. I'm going to forget half of their names. And it's like, we don't want to be kind of just lost in that mess. So if it's important and you want to be our first call, great, let's do it. If you want to wait a few days and we can be your first call on June 18th and we'll text on the 15th, that's cool too. Like we're not dying to like, we have to get you an hour on a zoom on the 15th. Like that's just not, I don't think really reasonable to think about. And it's not super respectful of like a recruits time. So uh, I always, I, I wish I would have gone through it. Cause I, I always think I know what that would be like, but man, for, for top kids in particular, I can't imagine what the 15th is like trying. And especially if you want to take a lot of calls, Oh, I have 10 schools I'm interested in. I mean, that's potentially 10 hours on zoom in a, in the hand, in, a, in like a day or two. It's too much. It would be too much for me. I'd be falling asleep. Okay, so this year you're here. You guys are stateside. You're in the Ville. So what's it going to – how are you guys going to determine what will be different? How will you play out the 15th? How will you game plan that this year? Like I said, I think we're going to divide up kind of maybe clubs that we as coaches specifically have some connections with or, or you know players that we might feel a little bit more connected with through camp or whatever it might be. And we're just going to make our, you know, we're going to make our texts and see what works for the recruit and go from there. And I mean, honestly, it's for us, that's, but that's very true to who we are as a staff yeah. and as a program. It's, we're, we're not pushy. Well, yeah, we're not, it, we just, things are going to work out the way that they need to work out. We're very competitive when it comes to recruiting, but we don't want to lose ourselves or lose our way. And we want to uh, make sure that the recruit kind of fits our style of how we're going to communicate and what their experience is going to be like here. So uh, again, it's very simple. We're just going to kind of divide up our list of the kids we're really interested in. We're going to get so, them on, you know, a Zoom or a FaceTime within a week of June fifteenth. Not all of them June fifteenth, um, because again, I don't want to take ten calls on June fifteenth too. I'm not going to be my best for the eighth one. I want to make sure everybody gets the best version of me. You know? So, like when you talk about, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around timelines, right? So. If you're trying to set up a call, are you texting at 1201? Like, hey, do you want to call? Or do you text so, me? You know what I mean? Because I know we might send out emails. We might send out emails at, at 1201. Maybe there'll be a text or two. I will have been asleep for four hours. I go to bed yeah, early. So it's probably going to be in the morning from me. Um, and then we'll we'll kind of see again, we're going to play it off of off the recruit of how they want to do it. I mean, if I were a recruit, I would say, hey, you know, it, let's say I get 80 text messages. All right. And I have 10 schools that are interesting to me. I would try to get back to those 70 and say, Hey, thanks, but no thanks. I would just have a script, you know, copy paste, boom, see ya. And then the other 10, I would say, Hey, I want to be really respectful of your time, but I want to make sure I give the best version of me. I'm trying to schedule my calls in the next five days. What day works for you? That's what I would do as a recruit. I kind of try to do that as a coach too. I try not to do maybe, you know, more than three or four in a day if I could, and certainly not do like three or four back to back to back to back. Um, because again, I'm so excited about Louisville. I think it's the best place in the country to play volleyball. Um, I don't want to be burned out on a fourth call and not be as excited to talk about Louisville as I always am. Um, you know, we, it's a lot of calls for us too. So we want to make sure that we're at our best. Yeah. Tongue in cheek a little bit, but I think I, if I'm going to be, if we're going to be pros at this or try, <laughs> we're not pros, but I, there are a couple schools that might've wrapped up their class by the time I woke up last year, I think. So I got to be better. I mean, I got to see, but I mean, there is, there is some legwork that goes in as far as, you know, recruiting during the year, you know, connecting with a club coach, seeing where that interest might be. And I mean, I get that when I grew up, you know, I, I grew up in Chicago and men's volleyball. I wanted to go to Loyola, like Loyola, Chicago was like, I get it for me. And if they would have offered yeah. me, I would have committed on the spot. They never did. I ended up going to state, which was great for me, but I had that dream school. Like I get, I get that. It's like, if you built that up in your head and, You've done your research. It's like I didn't. I wouldn't have had to visit there. I had seen games there. I would not have had to meet the coach, do a visit, anything. I would have committed on the spot to go there. Um, didn't happen for me, but I get why recruits do that because I had that school growing up too. So, 
yeah, there's a handful of recruits that have the ability to do that, get the offer. They have the dream school. Great. Um, you know, but again, I, I think the vast majority of recruiting is going a more traditional way. Let me ask you this uh, sidetrack a little bit. You, you said d- d- they did the research. How do you do the research? I mean, I mean, I get it. I, I get the, I get the politically correct questions and, I got to find out about the culture and is the campus pretty and blah, blah, blah. But how do they really do the research? Because I get the good or bad job of talking to a lot of athletes on the other end of this. And I'm telling you 90% of them, if I say, is your recruiting what you thought about when you're 16, when you're 19? And they're like, oh, right. It's never like, yeah, it was woo. Right. So what to, is the me, best way to research? So to me, it's all about relationships. Um, and I liken it to like, let's okay. say I'm going to get married. Let's okay, say I'm going to get I married and it's going to be so, like. All right. So let me, sorry, let me stop. Yeah. It's a, you're right. And I hear this all the time. So how do you build the relationship? How do you build the relationship at 12, 10 a.m.? So history doesn't repeat itself, but it, it rhymes. So I think that there's a lot of resources out there about the relationships that are have already been built. Go on a roster page, find out the kids who weren't back the next year. Did they transfer out? Did they quit? What's going on? Find them on Instagram, send them a DM. Say, I'm interested in this program. What did you think? And they'll be probably pretty honest. Find the All-Americans. Ask them what their experience was like. Find the player that was a senior and didn't play very much. And Yep. DM them. I would. That's what I would be doing. I'd be finding everybody I could around that program, and trying to find themes. Um, no matter what, you contact ten people, you're going to get ten different experiences. But there's going to be some themes involved. Whether you know coaches were super uh, blunt, coaches were whatever. Um, the downtime, you know, the downtime, the off days, what those were like, what travel was like. You're going to see different themes. So um, for me, it's again, it's. It, the relationships that you can expect to build are probably going to be very similar to the relationships that have already been built. So you find those alumni, you find those current players, you reach out to them and you find out what you can do. So to me, that would be what the research is. I'll go back to my example as a 16 year old kid. Cause I mean, I'm 40 now and I still remember this. I remember going to Loyola camp and talking to Brad Staub, who was a guy on the team and just seeing how he thought about the program. I knew like, man, that's the place I would want to go. And so for me, that was the research when I was a player. I think the same thing holds true for players today, whether you're going to camp and you get that in-person experience or social media is connected to everybody. Do some research on the website, find some people, get some different opinions, and you'd be shocked what you know people want to tell you about the program, good or bad. And I think yeah. that's going to go a long way in the research. Well, and I just don't, because on social media, I think um, you know the, the common theme out there from fan bases or whatever is if you call somebody that transferred it's like well the disgruntled former athlete right well they weren't playing so they no i i mean there are reasons both ways right just like there may be all americans who didn't love things or there may be somebody who just wanted they were homesick or you know um and to me that's the biggest concern for me as i talk to so many of these prospects or even their parents who are like, yeah, she's just like not ready to really start yet. She's like, mom, I don't want to talk about it right now. And I'm like, Oh kid, you know, yeah. like, I'm like, this is a big deal, right? Like you can't start on the 15th and commit on the 18th and be like, ah, I just, I, I really, I re- just had, a, I just knew I'm like, Oh, you know, I, maybe, maybe I'm, comp- I agree with you. I think that's tough. tough. Um, yeah, the research needs to be done before that. If you feel like you want to commit there, again, I, I think we're talking about such a select few group of athletes. Like yes, to me, when you're yes. talking about the 18th and you haven't really done your research and like maybe you get timelined. Um, to me, that is a very, very small section of caliber of athlete that would get that. And then also a really small section of coaches that would do that. Um, you know, coaches use timelines because they work. They get you to tell, you know, they get an athlete to tell you yes or no which is beneficial to the coach, honestly, in both ways. Because if you tell me no, boom, I can invest my time more in somebody who's more serious about my program. If you tell me yes, then I got my commitment. There's also, it's a double-edged sword because those timelines, they speed up the decision-making process to where, uh, again, you can make an irrational decision or, you know, 
select something just because you're worried about it, you know, going away as opposed to you're excited that it's there. Um, so it goes both ways. But like you said, I think the research, even I think it's OK if you start your research on the 15th, just don't commit on the 18th. But if you want to commit on the 18th, you should be like a month or two into really researching and knowing the program and, you know, having some contact with people who have gone through it or whatever it might be on your own. Um, I think it's really wild to think that you would commit somewhere a day or two after you talk to the coach for the first time and you haven't really lit, talked to anybody else around the program. So with the timeline, because that's something that's always really interesting to me, is that program by program? Is it athlete by athlete? Like something I heard us really diving into things with the 25s, I guess, 24s, quite a bit. But what I heard was, you know, the wives tale of, well, the better you are, the less timelines you get, right? Like programs will wait for you, the better you are. Um, or is it a program thing? Like, Hey, school X, they're always timelining people. Um, or is it just a position? Maybe like, I know maybe like setters, Hey, we have to have one. This is our year. It's a down year. We, we don't want to lose both. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, again, I think, I think it's program by program. I do think it's position by position. Like if you look at a specific position for a class and it's really it's really thin or you you think it's really thin at the top and you know there's three players you're really excited about and after that you don't think anybody else can help you i i get it where it's like hey you know and there's just so many different ways to go about timelines where it's hey you know you maybe have an offer uh, in a week we're going to offer somebody else that's kind of like a soft timeline it's like okay I, I understand that this could go away in a week but it still will be there um yeah. so there's just different ways to go about it but um Again, you know, for us as coaches, this is our livelihood. This is our job. So, like, yeah. it, it is a business, and it's becoming even more of a business. If you want to research some of the ESPN articles that have come out about the way that our sport is going, um, you know, it's it's a real thing. And I do think that college is a nice stepping stone or gateway into the real world, into a, a yeah. working environment. And I think that's the first experience with that, too. You know, the flip side of that would be, you know, I got to Louisville in 2017, and uh, I started January 1st and Danny, I think, talked to me about the job middle of November. And I think I told her in December that I would be there and that I was working January 1st. So that was my timeline committing to work here. It would be really irrational for me to say like, hey, Danny, I know it's November, but I should be able to give you an answer if I want to come to Louisville in April. Is that OK? Like I had to be on a timeline because we had work to do. We had to go recruit. We had to go do things. That's the real world. And so I, I get for for recruits, you know, it can seem kind of harsh, but I also get why programs do it sometimes because, you know, we can't just wait forever. You tell us, no, we all feel good about it. And then we don't have, when we pass okay. the ball. We don't have anybody there to set it because we didn't take anybody. We have to get somebody. <laughs> well, and, and that I will lead that uh, into my next uh, point of it. And I hear, cause we're in promotion, we're in education Right, we want to educate the recruiting process, talking about things we're doing now, but we're also in promoting the sport um, and some of the top athletes, right? Um, and so they have a bigger name when they get to college and beyond. Um, and and I think they should be proud, right? I mean, all this money they pour into club and lessons and time. If I mean, I'm a five foot eleven, chubby, slow kid who couldn't jump, right? I never got invited to anything. So to me, to get an uh, invite to a select camp, I'd be proud as heck. And I think it's okay to say that. You know, so the thing about, well, you know, not talking about it and, uh, you know, uh, those things, I'm like, you guys have the opportunity um, with the camps, right? That's a huge deal in the evaluation process, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think camps are massive and they, they've become even more important just the way that our timeline has shifted. Obviously, with June 15th, we can do camps starting, you know, after Memorial Day, which is typically June 1st. Um, so, yeah, camps are, are huge, like you said, from a talent standpoint, because, yeah, it is a huge honor to get an invite to a camp. Um, but then also, I think from the relationship standpoint of how is this kid going to be to coach? Um, how do they like our coaching? How do they respond to that? Um, an experience on campus that is a little bit different than a visit. It's more of just kind of being with the team, you know, training, being in the gym. I mean, I always go back to like, I've heard, I've heard recruits say, you know, pick a school that if you broke your leg and couldn't play, yep. that you'd be happy. 
And I've told you this before. I think that that's like horrible advice because the relationships, the people you're going to be around is all volleyball. If you're committing and you have a volleyball scholarship or a preferred walk-on spot or whatever you want to call it, that is your experience. You're, you're marrying those people um, for four years. And so to think like, hey, take that completely out, pick a school where I'd be happy if that wasn't there. It's like that's 80, 90 percent of your time. So um, that's why I think the camps are so important because the camp isn't a visit. It's all volleyball. It's the team. It's the coaches. It's the court. Um, and it's, it's the day-to-day experience of what you're going to get most of the time. So yeah, there's a lot of free time out of that. There's some cool things you can do, but the volleyball is really going to drive uh, a massive part of your experience when, you, you know, whichever college you pick. Well, and it, and I think knowing that understanding the business part of or you, <laughs> you guys, I mean, and, and for them, it's a dream and it's a lifelong dream and, you know, it's fun and they're playing and it's a game. You get to college, it, you know, still a game, but it's a business and it's becoming a very lucrative financial business. Um, and with that become very, very high expectations. Um, and I always tell people when you get there, it's a job, um, you know, and, and it's treated like that. And you can enjoy jobs and not enjoy jobs. But um, with, uh, with the camps, back to that. Because I get to talk to athletes and coaches. I hear coaches say, hey, it's so important. And if they're not coming to our camp, that means they don't they don't want us. Then I hear athletes say, hey, it's really expensive to go to all these. Or, hey, my club won't let me out of practice to go to this. So do you guys kind of weigh that? I'm, I'm guessing it's communication, like a recruiting coordinator telling you, hey, she just can't come or she really wants to, how do you weigh all that in? Because the financial burden part, or maybe they just can't get to it or there's yeah. something else. Well, and you, got club, you got club going on and nationals is looming. And I mean, there, there's a lot going on with that. You know, part of it is to understand how recruiting used to be where unofficial visits were allowed at any time. Um, you want to talk about financial burden. It was basically on the athlete to pay for their visits and their only official visit that was paid for was going to be to the school they committed to two years after the fact. So we've come a very, very long way from that. Um, it used to be, again, if you were a great 14, 15 year old player, you were interested in 10 schools. It was on you to get to those 10 schools and do an unofficial. Once you were there, okay, you could spend time with the coaches. You could do a visit. Um, so there were athletes that were forking out a lot of money. And then it would be a really big deal if it's like, hey, we really want you to come on an unofficial visit, spend all this money, come out here. And then they didn't get an offer and they spent all this money. It was it was a very, very weird recruiting process that we've come a long way from. So I think we're in a pretty good place here. You know, from the camp standpoint, it feels like three camps is like a lot. I know some kids will fit five or even more in, which is oh. pretty crazy to me. Um, but uh, well, how do you know that? Because we're not supposed to talk about that at all. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, social media. Wow. Shocker. But I, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. Like go enjoy your camp experience, pump it up. But you don't recruit fun, kids like, after they go to another camp, do you? Yeah. Come on. Uh, so, it, and that's the other thing too. It's Our, like, do you think that recruiting wise, we're not calling other people in your position? Like we get that you're talking to other schools. It's fine. Like that's, we do this every year. Um, yeah. But from the financial side of it, I, I would hope that schools, we've learned this and gotten better at this. I would hope that schools are being very selective with kids that they're really actively trying to get to camp. Because I do think, again, when we were here seven years ago, we had such a massive amount of, of recruits that we thought would potentially improve us. So we tried to get all of them to camp. And a lot of times we would, and maybe sometimes that wasn't the experience that they were looking for because they were thinking, hey, if I get this invite to this camp, this is my offer that's waiting for me. It, you know, and it was more of an evaluation type of situation for us. And so we've learned really uh, over the years to be better about our communication with that and better about our selection with that to make it a really big deal if we are trying really hard to get someone to camp. Um, And then on the flip side of that, I do think, like you said, having the player really try to get that information because whether it's through your recruiting coordinator, um, you know, whatever it might be, I think you can really find the heart of where that kind of camp invitation is. Is this more of just an eval? Is this did you just invite me because I'm listed at 6'2"? Did you invite me because, you know, you might take a setter? Did you invite me because you're taking three middles and I'm a middle? This is great. Like, there's vastly different, you know, situations you can be walking into with camp. 
And again, you know, hopefully having a good support system with your recruiting coordinator or your club coach, I think they can get those answers pretty easy. Um, just of where a college is at, what you know, what their situation may or may not be, um, all within the you know within the confines and the rules of NCAA uh, rules and all that. I think it's opened up to the fact that we can make sure that those questions are kind of at least a little bit more clear before kids come on campus. Right. For camp. Um, let's just get into this because you've been great about being transparent and and again, I just want to bake it so kids, parents understand. Um, it just they can make their own decision afterwards. But um, really, battles we're trying to you know change things and educate. Um, what I hear a lot is, "Hey, I don't want to say anything because I don't want to close any doors on my recruitment." Right. But I hear from a lot of college coaches and I'm in sales, my other business, a, a firm heck no is a lot better than stringing you along with a maybe for three months. Is it the same way with recruiting where if you if you guys really don't have much of a chance with somebody, you would rather hear that very early so you can just move on rather than them saying just because it looks good to have that logo and say they talk to Louisville. Is that how it is? Yeah. I, I think or? that that's like in a, in a perfect world. Yeah. But that doesn't happen. The, the, that doesn't happen for us where they're like, they're making that decision. Like it, that seems great in theory, but I don't think that that happens where no, before I know you have a firm. Yes. Before you have the offer from the school that you really want, you're telling these other schools, no, um, but as, as colleges, as, as recruiters, it's like, you can, you can feel that pretty easily. Like just the intuition of conversations that it, it oozes out of people kind of where they're at. And I would like to think we read that pretty well. My other thing too, with not telling someone no, or saying, Hey, I'm more, I'm going to focus more on these other schools is that if it's a talented player, if it's somebody that you think can help you, you know, we have very short memories as coaches. We play 30 matches a year. We don't win all of them. We've got pretty short memories. Um, so it's like, let's say a, a player is like, hey, I'm going to focus on these three schools. Uh, you know, I'm really excited about them. And it doesn't work out. And then two weeks later, they come back and say, hey, you know, it didn't work out the way I thought it would. Right. I, I am actually really interested. It's like, great, let's roll. Yeah. No hard feelings. I don't care. Like, it's fine. You know, that it's not, it's not a straight line for recruiting. And um, I think too much, you know, and you know what, there are probably college coaches out there that would hold a grudge or would react differently and stuff, but it's like there, then you have your answer. Don't go there. You and know? that like, should be a red flag. For everybody. <laughs> yeah, Shouldn't that so, be a red flag that you don't want I to go totally there agree. anyways? Yeah, for sure. Well, it's like I hear from the kids that say, yeah, you know, they're so anxious, which I have anxiety, suffered from it my whole life. I can't imagine having to call five coaches and tell them I'm going somewhere else. But then when a kid tells me a coach yells at him, you know, and I'm like, I still can't believe that that happens. I've I, heard those stories too, where coaches I, are just like so mad or they're I, like grilling them or, I'm you know, I will tell you kid. when we get no's, when we get no's, maybe for even college coaches that might listen, we try to get to the heart of what was missing. You know, yes. Hey, was there anything else that you didn't see or that you saw somewhere else that you didn't know if we had or, and you know, a lot of times you don't get anything out of that, but every once in a while you get something of like, Hey, you know, I didn't really like on the visit when we did X or, you know, I wish on the visit we would have done Y or whatever it might be. Um, so we do those conversations, but um, I've heard those same horror stories too, of like how coaches were when someone told them no. And I don't Especially know, I, I've never portal. understood that. With the portal now, right? Like, I mean, as big as the portal is, why would you want to burn any kind of a bridge? That's a good point um, too. And, and athletes do talk. I mean, yeah. we did that postseason. the, the post evaluation of the 25s last year, and it had to, you know, it was confidential, but there were certain programs where it was like, Hey, were there any red flags? And there were some that consistently came up, they talk. And, and I think that, you know, they put their names to them, but th that was consistent where those things come up. And, and I think recruits talk about it and, and they may not come out and just, you know, blur it like other sports do, but, I guess my my only thing is that it's okay to say, I I just think these girls it's okay and it's not being cocky, it's not being conceited to say, hey, when DBK wore that unbelievable jacket at the Final Four a few years ago, I wanted to autograph. So 
the fact that I went to her select camp and had a fun time, okay, Dan Fisher in Pitt isn't going to say, that's it. She's off our list. Yeah, I totally agree with you. So Fish is digging I hope, I hope it doesn't go that way where kids can't really enjoy it and pump up. Yeah. The it's like, and, and the other thing is if somebody is telling you no, don't like – if a college coach is saying, hey, don't talk about that you're talking to us, that should be a red flag. Yeah, I think that's fair. Right? And if somebody else... But like you said, you're in sales. It's the people business, too. Of you know, I've, I've learned that the more I've been in coaching. Um, just that people are people. And, you know, as we... We might have different jobs and different professions, but like coaching and people and teams and organizations, I mean, it's all the same stuff, you know, and it's the relationship business. It's getting to know people. It's, it's trusting your read on people. Um, so that's what we that's what we've done here to be successful. I think it's just gotten great people around here. Like you talked about college becomes a job like you go to college to be a college athlete like it's a job. And I think that's really fair. But it's also like I have a job and I love it. Like yeah. I look forward to it every day. I think you can love the job you have. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I do think college athletics, like it's a job, but it's a job you should love. And you should, my biggest thing would be, you need to go to a place that you hear or you feel that you're going to love volleyball more when you graduate than when you got there. Yes. Because I hear too often that that does not happen and it crushes me. And it's part of the reason I feel like I'll maybe coach forever is because like, I can't guarantee that that's happened to every single kid who's ever played at Louisville. But I think the vast majority it has. And I think that's what, that's what gets me up in the morning is like, I want everybody to love volleyball as much as I do and to love it more today than they did yesterday and leave wanting to play in the PBF or love or overseas or whatever it might be because they just are on fire about this sport that's so awesome. So find that in the recruiting process and go get that. Well, and, and I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm just trying to kind of be real because I learned, you know, I'm, Unfortunately, I learned not to believe only what you see on Sports Center a long, long time ago, right? And <laughs> they edit those things for a reason, right? Because sometimes what really happens behind the scenes at the right, the glamour places isn't the most fun, yeah. right? Um, and and I hear it too long. I, I heard that, you know, from three transfers this year, right? Like I just want to go and try and learn to love volleyball again. And and it does crush me. Crushes. It breaks really... my heart to hear that. I, I hate hearing that. And uh, there's so many different reasons that, that that could be there. But as coaches, it's like hopefully we're doing everything we can to make sure we're moving the needle, that people are falling more and more in love with the sport. That's, I mean, for all of my colleagues has provided everything. I mean, every stitch of clothing, every house I've ever had, every everything my kids do has all been through the sport of volleyball. Like we owe so much to the sport. Like the least we can do is give back and get people to love it more and more. Cause it's, I mean, Danny says this all the time too, with our team, like I probably a handful of times a year, she'll bring in a huddle either in a game or in a practice. And she'll be like, can you believe we get to do this? Like we're trying yeah. to keep the ball off the floor. We're playing a glorified version of keep the balloon off the floor. One of the first games we ever play as a kid and we all get to do this. We get our education paid for, or we get a salary or like we get to be on ESPN. Like this is incredible. So um, it's got me fired up. I mean, I'm fired up about recruiting the, you know, the future athletes, you know, in 26 and 27. And, and then man, August is bearing down on us too. So well, this is a cool time of year. You talked about how is it right now? It's like, we just got our off time in May, but then it's like, boom, recruiting camps season, you know, then Thanksgiving, then Christmas. It's like, I love this buildup that we have coming right now. It's really cool. And I want to leave you with two things. One, I won't leave on the point because I think it's important and you will touch on it truthfully. I tell athletes, and they don't listen to me, I'll listen to you. This, for parents and athletes, they're not going to upset. I mean, if they go out and do something really stupid, um, maybe. But this is the time they have the power in the process, right? You want them, right? They are being... Yeah, I would, I would think that that's fairly obvious. It's like, well, you it's know, in, in a stream, yes. Like you said, timelines will come into it or... I'm not getting enough love or I'm not, what's that school doing or they've gone cold or whatever, but it's like, you're going to get the reaction on what you're focusing on, you know, and there's, there's going to be plenty of opportunities. It may not be the the conference, the division or whatever you, you envision, but if you're fired up about volleyball, the opportunities are endless and you can find your place uh, where you're really wanted. Right. But I, I actually disagree. I don't think um, that's obvious because of, <laughs> Fair the enough. athletes are so scared to 
I mean, wear a certain color sweatshirt or, you know what I mean? Like they're so scared to talk about anything or brag about anything because they're worried about missing an opportunity. And I'm like, guys, that's not how it works. If Port of Vallarta University, I hope that's not a real school, right? If they <laughs> really, really want you, they will come get you. Now, if they don't want you, they won't. But it's not because of something you wear isn't going to change that. So it's not because of uh, all that silly stuff has very, very little bearing on on anything. I mean, it's maybe something to talk about, but that's about it. Right. Or anything we put out there, because ninety nine and a half percent of you coaches don't even know who I am anyways. And you probably wish you didn't. So uh, (laughs) but and so tell them that the guys enjoy this recruiting process. Right. I would hope so. Yeah. I mean, I I think you nailed it on the head. It's yeah, it's. There's there's probably too many stories of people that get maybe too caught up in things they either don't have control of or things they hear secondhand or anything like that. And it's like it is a really fun time. I know that there yeah. there should be, you know, we talk about this with our, our matches, too. It's like, you know, butterflies are a good thing and anxiety sometimes manifests itself in different ways. But it's like it means it's important to you and um, it means you should enjoy it. You know, we get the same thing, big you know nerves or whatever you want to call it before a big match. But it's like if that stuff's not coming something's wrong. So enjoy it. Realize that that's your, you know, that's your reaction to something that's really important to you that you should enjoy and you should take a step back from and and really look like, whoa, this is a cool moment that I'm living. And their process is their process. I know focus on, and I tweet about way too much, the top, you know, 100, but it's 1%. We're talking 1%. If you get any kind of an offer, it doesn't matter. So you be proud of anything that you get. Your process is their process, right? I mean, I know you probably got all kinds of offers, but I didn't. I, I told you my dream school, they didn't even know who I was. And I grew up 30 minutes from there. So, and it worked out the way it was supposed to work out too. Like I, I probably would not be sitting here now coaching had I gone down that road. So for me, like you said, this is God, 25 years ago, whatever it was, everybody's process is, is so unique and um, you can't always see, you know, the forest from the tree sometimes of like what's actually happening. So, um, yeah, I think you nailed it on the head there. I mean, I would, I would, em- I would emphasize and reiterate the same things of like, just take an opportunity to enjoy it. You know, if you want to do that extra camp, do that extra camp. If, you know, the opportunity shifts that you had before it, that was meant to be, because, you know, it's about, it's about what you want to do and where you want to be. Well, and I'll, I'll have athletes, uh, you know, my, they, I'll have athletes say they'll update their player profiles on our site and they'll be like, well, I just, um, I'm just looking at more academic school. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm like, the schools you're putting down that you're camping at, you're going to make more in your first year out of college. Than I made my whole life. You should be proud <laughs> that you get into the, like, be proud of that. That's your yeah. journey, your process. One percent of one percent are going on to go pro, anyways. And maybe, maybe more than that now, though, man. If PVF can survive and Love can, you know, get rolling, and it was a pretty cool season that we had with the, with PVF and that that championship in Omaha and all that. And they're talking about adding teams, but um, the opportunities. It seems like it's like the best time in American history to be a volleyball player, be involved in the sport of volleyball. So I think we're we're right on the cusp of our kind of um, you know college women's basketball moment they had with Caitlin Clark. Um, I feel like volleyball, we're, we're in our infancy of that. I feel like we're a couple of years away from our moment. Yeah, but that doctor at Johns Hopkins, um, she's going to be one taking care of all you uh, soon-to-be million-dollar coaches when your stress levels go through the, yeah, through right. the roof. Yeah, let me know when that happens. <laughs> hey, close. we got horses and we're close. everything going on. Don't get me. We're close. That's pretty <laughs> hey, wild. I, I do want to get the contract the you're, you're the, referring to. Um, you I know the contract about- you're referring to. It was a place I maybe have gone through, and it's it is wild to think about when I started there, what has happened to the sport. And for those that you know, you can read between the lines of what what all that is. But man, like when I got there versus now, and I mean, it feels like I've only been in coaching for just a blink of an eye, and I guess now it's 16 years or 17 years, whatever it is. Um, the support really has gone through the roof. Man, the coverage we have on, on TV and um, support staff that we're getting them, you know, mental health you know, all of that, like yeah. mental performance coaches. I mean, we have just gotten so much. There's a lot to be thankful for in the last, you know, 10 to 15 years. And even the last five years, it's just yes. kind of been on fire. So like I said, I think it's the best time in American history to be a part of the sport in any regard, player, coach, fan, any of that. 
Well, I don't mind talking about that at all. I think it's awesome, just the rivalry. And the best thing about college sports, and I think volleyball needs more of them. That's why um, you guys are, I think you guys are a part of rival, the second biggest rivalry right now in, in college volleyball. And I love it. Uh, but love it. Love it. I think Thank it's great you. that, um, you know, the burn orange just happened to be the number one paid coach for a little bit. And then, oh, no, 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 no. We're not going to let that be okay. <laughs> There was a rumor back in the day, too, about uh, now that he's retired, I'll talk about it. But like Russ Rose at Penn State had some type of thing in his contract that he would always be the highest paid or something. But like, I don't know. I don't know if you ever heard that like urban legend. That was like when I was in my 20s, everybody would say that. But Penn State doesn't disclose their contracts. I guess I don't really know much about these contracts. I know, you know, these journalists are able to get them somehow. But um, there was always an urban legend about that. So I think it's funny. I didn't even think about that until you mentioned it of like the, the little one upsmanship, but uh, I'm fired up about it. I mean, they talk about, I know we're talking about recruiting here, but they talk about in uh, softball, there's like six coaches making over a million dollars or something, which I didn't know. And in volleyball, we're not, we're not there yet. And it feels like we've got more coverage and eyeballs and, and all that, but uh, who knows college, college sports and the landscape's always shifting and changing. I'm just, I'm just happy to be a part of it. Well, your boss will be happy to know my my prediction was she would be the first million dollar coach, so she'll be happy. <laughs> and, and Maybe you she'll know take us to Mexico or something. <laughs> but I do want to leave. Yeah, people tune in and they're like, "I thought this was about recruiting. What are we talking about?" Yeah, I don't know how we got. <laughs> but I, I want to leave you um, because people think that's all we talk about recruiting. But you're a coach, right? And you guys have to be. Tell me about you're going through this recruiting. You love it. You guys are good at it. But after the wave last year ended coming so close, that final four, right? And the five set loss and losing a pit. How chomping at the bit is your squad to get back in the gym and be done with this? And like, especially with the final four in the Ville, like, I mean, you yeah. want to be like, heck with this, give me a <laughs> volleyball and let's go. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we kind of wrapped it up with this too, because yeah, the final four is going to be in Louisville. Um, man, we were uh, two of the last three. We were there last year. Um, we were up 2-0 and then lost to Pitt for the second time. We were up 2-0 on mm -hmm. them twice this year. Um, actually, we were up 2-0 on them three times. We swept them once and then we lost in five, unfortunately, twice. Uh, but uh, man, it's, you know, I think for our group, if I could say anything about our group and just year to year is that one stung, you know, but so did losing in the national championship. So did losing in you know the semi the year before that. And so I think that, you know, final four or not, I think it's like a silver lining or a cool thing about our program that it's not like, Oh, we made the final four. Now it's okay to lose. Like if we lose, at least we got there. I think that each year it was like, man, like there's one goal and we want to be, there's only one team that gets to win the last match and it hasn't been us yet. And um, so I think, yeah, th there might be a little bit more just because it, it was pit, you know, our rival or, um, you know, whatever it might be. But I do think year to year, it's that same type of fire um, that I've seen from this group. And, you know, Anna DeBeer is somebody who sticks out, who's been here through all of that. Her and Elena Scott, two local kids that have been through all of those years with us. And, um, you know, I, I look at players like that and kind of how they approach the off season in the summer. And I don't see it like, ooh. Now they're into it this this summer. I think we would we would have had a hard time having success in years past had it not been like that prior. Um, but maybe there's like you know a little bit more seasoning on it this this summer. Well, I just I mean for numerous reasons I want to uh, I want to see you guys there. But number one, I just I be I become a follower of DBK's uh, fashion, and I just want to see what <laughs> she would too. wear in the hometown. Oh yeah, so you'd have something good. You know that. She's dreaming. She's dreaming about it probably right now, but she lays down <laughs> at night. So, well, hey, Dan, we'll let you go. Um, Dan Meske, uh, assistant coach, national assistant coach of the year, uh, by the way. We didn't mention that, and uh, he has been huge for me, um, helping me out. And we thank you for your time, buddy. Good luck with the recruiting. Good luck with your summer, and we'll talk to you soon. Hells up. Go Cards. Appreciate you. Thanks, Darren. All right. Enjoy the veil, buddy. Hey, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to the VB Adrenaline podcast. And we will be back with more episodes to come, focusing on recruiting um, and some of the stars and important names in the game, education, promotion, and just building up this incredibly 
fast growing sport. So tune in, follow us on the X at volleyballadrenaline.com underscore and continuing to to continuing to grow our new Instagram account at Volleyball Adrenaline. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon. Take care.